it's really been great to have people like you in the city and the energy, but before even we get into this conversation today, I just want to ask, who is Gary Chambers for the people who may not know you right now? Uh, Gary Chambers is uh, a navigated boy from North Baton Rouge, okay. uh, to make it simple. Uh, I grew up in North Baton Rouge uh, in kind of a complicated uh, story, so my biological mother and father were married, uh, and I was the third child, um, and my mother committed suicide when I was two months old. So then my village, the words of Dr. Key, stepped in uh, and gave me uh, an aunt and uncle who became my mother and father and gave me this beautiful middle class black life uh, that developed me into uh, someone who's very centered in my community in North Baton Rouge, uh, but also uh, recognizing the challenges that we face as a community. Uh, act actually, I became an activist by accident. I was not actually seeking to be an advocate. I was a small business owner uh, in Baton Rouge, owned a media company called Rouge Collection, as well as a consulting firm. And like many of you, when different things happened around the country, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, those things impacted me. So uh, I try to tell these stories differently in every room. Uh, I wrote my first column about kind of social uh, justice issues when Trayvon was killed. When Mike Brown was killed, I held my first town hall. Like 20 people came to the town hall meeting that I had. Uh, and then a few uh, months later, a brother named Lamar Johnson, a few weeks before Sandra Bland, said he hung himself in Parish Prison in Baton Rouge. It didn't go viral, it wasn't a story everybody knew about. Um, and for me, uh, I wrote a column, 40,000 people read it. That led to a broader conversation about what was happening in our criminal legal system we had uh, a district attorney who was bringing a misdemeanor jail every year where they were rounding up basically poor folks with traffic violations and uh, carting them off to jail. Um, my logic was if you can't handle parish prison, then you can't handle this misdemeanor jail and that we shouldn't have this. And so we went from uh, writing columns to showing up at city council meetings. I showed up at my first city council meeting and Several dozen other young black men showed up. We killed a misdemeanor jail, and I've never stopped advocating since. Um, and from a host of issues, the health care, uh, access to contracts and procurement has been kind of my understanding evolved. Once you go to your first city council meeting, you're sitting there and you're seeing all these line items on the budget, and you're like, wait a minute, that's my money. And it ain't going to people that look like me. Uh, and so that kept me involved in the process. No, I'm glad you brought that up because I think about you, especially as somebody who writes a lot about politics in the South. Um, over the last five or six years, there's been a wave of new, non-traditional black candidates, especially in a state like Louisiana, which has one of the highest populations of black people in the United States. So I'm gonna ask you right now, which is, as a black man, um, it seems like the odds have been stacked against you to even run. Why would you even consider running now for such a high seat in the, city, in the state of Louisiana? So, uh, it has been since 1873 since a black person has held statewide office in Louisiana. Um, I keep telling this story about PBS Pitchback because I think every black person in America should know his name. Um, this is a black man who becomes the president of the state senate in Louisiana. Uh, Oscar Dunn is the lieutenant governor, a black man is the lieutenant governor of Louisiana. Oscar Dunn dies. PBS Pinchback is the president of the state senate, so he ascends to become the lieutenant governor. The governor of the state of Louisiana, white man, was removed, and for 36 days, PBS Pinchback is the governor of the state of Louisiana. It is until 1990 before Douglas Wilder is elected governor of Virginia in this country. And there have only been four black people to serve as governor of the state in this country. There have only been 11 black people to serve in the United States Senate. But we keep delivering for the party. We mobilized people to ensure that Joe Biden could even be there, right? Because on election night, what were we waiting on? Philly, Atlanta, <laughs> Detroit, right? The cities that we inhabit, the places that we have centered ourselves is where we were waiting for the answers about where the rest of the country was going to get their president from, right? right? And so the question becomes for me in Louisiana, not why, why not? Because we are already making this happen for other people. There's a Democrat as the governor of Louisiana right now. 
he would not be there if it were not for the power of the black vote. Uh, John Kennedy, who's the current U.S. Senator, was elected with 536,000 votes. There's 1.2 million black people in the state of Louisiana. I'm going to do math again. 536,000 is less than 1.2 million black folks. Okay? There are more of us in the state of Louisiana than most folks know. And what Georgia did is not uh, impossible for Louisiana, for Mississippi, for Alabama, for uh, Tennessee, for Arkansas. I'm just audacious enough to say, nah, not me. Um, because we continue to build power for others that does not bring equity for us. Um, and for me, rather than to continue to be uh, in negotiations with people who don't fully understand my struggle, right, about how to represent my humanity there, we need to send more people there to represent our humanity. Uh, when you look at the fact that, and I was sharing this uh, earlier, you have uh, Senator Warnock, you have Senator Booker there, uh, and Tim Scott too, but you know, he's a Republican, so uh, that don't really count. So you got two black U.S. senators there in a room with 100 people, and 98 of them don't come from your culture, don't come from your community, don't understand what you are dealing with, and you got two folks trying to get those 98 people to come along with us. We need to expand our margins, not just for the party, but for our people, to ensure uh, that we get some form of equity across this country, some form of justice across this country. Um, and so for me, I don't look at things from the perspective of what's against me. I look at it from the perspective of what's for me. Uh, when, when they went to Bible Sunday, so I'm going to talk about church. Uh, in the Bible, um, when Moses sent Joshua to the Promised Land, and told him to look and scout the land. Part of the group came back and said, they got giants over there. We can't go over there. They're going to they gonna kill us if we go over there where the giants said. <laughs> and then Joshua came back and said, I see grapes the size of a man's head. What I'm telling you is I see grapes the size of a man's head. I see opportunity for us like never before. So I don't worry about the giant that's before. I worry about the reward, the milk and honey that exists for us. Matter of fact, the milk and honey that our tax dollars pay for, okay? That's feeding other communities right now every day. Everybody in this room paying the government their taxes, all right? The church, we look at the church and we ask the church to help us solve some of our problems. I heard Bishop T.D. J. say something one time. The church get 10% of the money from some of the people. The government get 30% of the money from all the people. But we're asking the church to fix the government's problems, right? Healthcare. Jesus laid hands on the sick, they recover, right? That's healthcare in a time when they didn't have all these traditional medicines we have. Well, why ain't better care for all good for us? Why ain't there a system where we can ensure that every person has access to health care in this country? If it was given for Jesus to, to make sure that people recover from their illness, why can't the government take 30% of the money from all the people, give the people health care in the richest country on earth? I'm with you. And that actually brings us to another question. Um, which is you've done something that people in many cases would say that's too risky to do, which is you've advocated for something that affects all of us um, disproportionately, which is marijuana incarceration and marijuana discriminatory laws. Your ad, particularly called 37 Seconds, has now been seen about 20 million times across the internet. And that's something that's remarkable because your competitor has spent well over a million dollars in ads and hasn't had a tenth of the traction. So I want to bring this up, which is for some. I know I got you. I got you. So for somebody who's making an impact with one thing, that making my case for me, you know. And then, no, but what I want to bring up is that uh, marijuana laws have been disproportionately bad to black men in Louisiana, in particular. And so I want to know what was going through your thought process when you wanted to even do that ad, and then what has been the response in Louisiana since it's come out. So I'm gonna start with the B part. What's the response been in Louisiana? Overwhelmingly good. Okay. 68% uh, of Louisianans believe that we should have uh, recreational cannabis legalized. Uh, the state legislature has gotten further with uh, the recreational bill than it ever has before. It's being carried by Republicans right now. Uh, for those who don't understand the sausage making process, uh, it may be more beneficial to us that a Republican is carrying the bill uh, because it is a Republican led legislature. And if we can get this Republican to do something that's going to benefit all of us, go ahead, sir. Right? Um, the, the front part, first I'm going to shout out my videographer and media director, Erin Marino, who's over there and holding the camera. Please give us a video that she can Erin shot that video, and um, 
black people influence everything. Uh, he's 29 years old, uh, and what I don't do is get in the way. Uh, he has a talent that visually knows how to articulate the thoughts that are in our head. Um, and so my comms director came to me with uh, the idea, the script that he brought me is why we did it. Um, that every 37 seconds somebody in this country is arrested for cannabis use and disproportionately that's black folks. And if there are black folks sitting in their going penitentiary for what amounts to simple possession of cannabis, uh, while people are in uh, California, Illinois, and all these other places making millions of dollars off of cannabis. And so if, it, if me smoking the blunt gets you to have a conversation about what's happening in the inequity, then I would do that any time I have to to drive the conversation. Um, what we intend to do with this campaign is prove that we don't have to have as much money as they have. We got to have money. We don't have to have as much as they have because we have skills they don't have. Um, and we are going to continue to captivate the country by driving the conversation through uh, strong data-driven messaging, right, that connects to imagery that is captivating and compelling. Uh, I don't apologize for uh, making you talk about an issue that's important to us. And if that makes some folks uncomfortable, I'm cool with that because I don't believe it's the majority of people. No, and I like that because your next ad um, has also gotten, not necessarily because it's a little younger in the process, but quite a few million views now, and it's one of the more controversial ones. Um, in that ad in particular, you burned the Confederate flag, and as we've seen um, across the U.S., the, the issue of the flag has been raised again, especially uh, George Floyd, especially what happened in the tragedy in South Carolina. And Georgia now is the last state in the country to still have a Confederate flag flying. Why do you think, in particular for you, it was important to burn the Confederate flag in the ad? So for those who don't know, before I went by for the blood, I went by for Kanye, all right? And the school board made it in Baton Rouge. Um, and we were talking about Robert E. Lee and the name of the school being after Lee. What most folks don't know is I have a 12-year-old daughter in the Baton Rouge Public School System who is in the track that she would end up at what is now Liberty High School, okay? At the time, her mom came to me and said, uh, this is, you know, we talk about where she going to school, middle school, high school, but she on the track to end up at Lee. I said, well, she ain't going to Lee. And my mom said, well, why she can't go to Lee? I said, well, it's named after Biggie. I don't want my daughter to have a high school diploma named after Biggie. My mom said, well, I guess you got to do something about it. Okay? Uh, and so not just my, myself, but several of my friends had kids who were at this school, right? And I'm giving you this context to how we get to the end because what you see in the end is on brand for me. Um, that any time you look at imagery, consistently perpetuated in front of us that is connected to racism and institutional uh, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement. Unless you remove that imagery, you can't do the work of undoing all of the policies attached to that industry, industry, uh, imagery. For me, burning the flag, same thing that came to me in the script uh, and said, we think you should burn the Confederate flag. What confirmed it for me was the next day the Supreme Court kicked down Alabama's maps, right? The Supreme Court says, well, no, the Supreme Court says that they're going to kick down the lower ruling of the court who said that the maps in Alabama were unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said that they're going to intervene on that ruling and they're going to hear the case, right? That Alabama's maps right now can stand. But Alabama 27% black with one congressional district, right? They should have two. So should Louisiana. The same thing in Bay, Georgia. Well, where did the desire to gerrymander come from? The images of PBS pitchback Oscar Dunn and all those black folks in Louisiana that they don't want to show you that were elected right post-slavery, right? They don't want that to happen again. And what we see is really a reaction to Georgia. What you see is the rest of the country, if in 1873 when PBS pitchback becomes the governor of Louisiana, that Structures and systems around this country work to ensure that that would not happen again for a hundred years. 
You think Georgia putting in Rafael Warnock wasn't going to send a smoke signal to the rest of the country to turn the heat back up that we got to stop this because if we don't, we going to end up with more of them in power. Otherwise, we gonna end up, if we are not intentional with what we do right now, it will be another hundred years before you see another. And, and I think that we are naive to, 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 to think that the Confederacy is not still involved in the legislation and the policies that exist in our country. You have people who stormed the United States Capitol last year holding the Confederate flag, right? So burn, I'm not gonna cuss, burn it down. Burn every remnant of the Confederacy from every piece of policy that exists in this nation. And burning it, if it offends you, you probably offend it. And we need to know that. Because they used to come to your house with a cross and a cape. Now, they sit in your judge in your courtroom with a black robe on. They put a badge on and walk your community every day. And we don't know who you are. But if we burn the flag and you get mad about it, you tweet about it, you send me an email about it, it's cool, baby. We know who you are now. We can put you in that category, put you right there. We know who you are. Now that's going to do the people's business because we know who the bigots are. Let's put them to the side and everybody who's not for these policies that are connected to the Confederacy, every policy in America that you look at that is extremely problematic, housing, gerrymandering, housing, the GI Bill, right? When you talk about how many families got put ahead by the GI Bill in the early uh, 19th century, all those people who uh, were giving money from the government to advance their families to buy a home, that then when they died, they left an inheritance to their children in their home, that then those children had assets of $100,000, $200,000 to put equity into a business or to start their own stuff, that we didn't have those advantages, and not we being told that we need to be able to do all of these things that other communities do. How do we do them when you gave them all the advantages with my money? With my money? And with that, I want to ask, when you become Louisiana's next senator, what is the first thing you're doing when you get in office? I think that, you know, people ask that, and I can tell you uh, something, but it probably wouldn't be true. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why. You don't know the complexities of the moment when you walk in. And I don't want to lie to people. What is important to me is the economy and how we write the economy for everybody in this country. Because I trust you enough that if you got more money in your pocket, you're going to know how to help your family. Right? I've seen the time and time. I see, my grandmother passed away on January 6th of 2021. I did not know that my grandmother lived with a $900 a month check until she died. But I never went to him a house and couldn't eat. The lights was never off. And she always had a little money if I needed some gas when I was young. And she ain't getting up to $900 a month. And she was so prideful that I didn't know it until she was dead. How many people do you know that you connected to that get $900 a month living in America today? I want to do something for them people. Because if we fix their problems, the rest of the country will write itself if people just have the resources to provide for themselves. And so as a United States Senator, if we deal with poverty in this country, if we deal with the issues of income inequality that exists in this country, the wealth gap, we can, we can give people the tools that they need to be successful on the right side of their families. And with that, we've seen over the last 12 months what it's been when the Democrats on their own, with their own senators have obstructed policy. When you get in, what do you say to people who still feel as if, hey, you know what, we like you, Gary, but you know, your party can't do anything on the Senate because two senators in particular are holding this back. What do you say to that person? Well, I ain't gonna say that to them, because I'm gonna tell y'all right now, it ain't just about me. It's Charles Booker in Kentucky. It's Val Demons in Florida. It's Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. It is uh, Malcolm Kenyatta in Pennsylvania. Uh, let me see who else I'm leaving somebody. You got Warnock running again. You got to get uh, Brother Warnock reelected, right? Yeah. It's not just about me getting elected. It's about us building the political power around this country to take our little nickels and dimes and put together, not just for me, but y'all need to be bringing in all of the people I just named and making sure that this, this so-called black mecca in Atlanta that exists gives the power to do in other places to help Brother Warnock so that we can all advance. Because one of us can't do it. I just told you two of them down there were 98.
Don't expect me to go down there and be the crazy man. What we need is more of us down there. And we need a collective strategy to talk about. So I am intentional about not just talking about myself. Now, I can't, I can't guarantee you that when they come on this stage, they're going to talk about me. But everywhere I go, I'm going to talk about them. Because this is collective sacrifice for collective gain. And if all of us in this room reach into our networks, we can do something to help each one of those people in our own little way. And that's how we make this change happen. It is never going to be one individual that makes the change happen. Dr. King and all of the phenomenal work that he did. The reason y'all got all these phenomenal names on these highways is because there's a whole bunch of other people surrounding that work, helping make that work happen. We got to make sure that we're doing that in this generation the same way that our elders did. We love to talk about all of the work that they did, but the truth is they were willing to put aside egos, personal interests, and personality conflicts for the greater good of the people. The question is, you got all your cash and wealth and all that talk. I heard us talking about all that wealth building, and that's good. I want more black billionaires, more black billionaires. But you can have a bunch of black billionaires and black folks still living in poverty. Well, how to, well, make, it make, make it make sense. If we had more black governors, though, right? A governor controls $30, $40 billion a year. A year. And Jay-Z and Beyonce, you know, they might have 10 billion total. Okay? These people move moving billions a year. The city of Atlanta, I know it's billions of dollars a year. Right? So what if you can do that in three or four states and the impact economically that they has to transform communities? And so from the Senate level to these governor's races, uh, Stacey Abrams needs to be the governor of Georgia. Georgia, hello. <laughs> You know, because of the power that comes with that, right? And then the economic power that we get to move around this country as a result of that. And so I got one question before we open up for the audience for you, which is you, you managed to galvanize a lot of people in places that people didn't expect. Nobody expected, no offense, that Louisiana would have a strong black candidate coming out, especially this year. What do you say to people in other parts of the country now who are seeing what you're doing and they still feel like maybe I'm not Gary Chambers, I don't have a following, or I may be not as a great speaker. What do you say to that person who wants to do something, but they just don't feel like they have enough to get there? Let me put this into perspective. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I had 8,000 followers on Instagram. 8,000, all right? Ahmaud Arbery gets killed. I do a video because they had some white guys in my neighborhood. I live in an all-black subdivision in Baton Rouge. They had some white guys pop up in my neighborhood and start knocking on doors and stuff, right? I don't know white folks live in my neighborhood, so what y'all looking for in the middle of the day right now? You know what I didn't do, though? Go bother them. I made a video about it, telling people, these people in my neighborhood, I'm not going to harass them. Four million people watch it, right? I didn't know 4 million people were going to watch the video. I went from 8,000 to 24,000. But I was already doing the work before that, right? There were video after video of me showing up at city council meetings all these years. So every time that I had a viral moment, it wasn't a moment for me. It was connected to the work I was already doing. A few weeks later, George Floyd protests break out, right? Uh, I go to the protest, and I'm looking for the, the radical. Not the people who just like come march. The ones who stay after the march. The ones who stay after the march, they're the ones who would tear the whole city up if you let them. But they're also the ones who could transform the whole city if you harness that energy, right? Show up at the protest, follow these young people around, uh, earn their trust, go viral again. A few weeks later, I'm at the school board with Kathy. I got 24,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, I had a Facebook used to be where I had uh, the largest audience. And that was really like a, a Baton Rouge audience for me, really. I had like 30,000 followers on Facebook. I had 1,000 followers on Twitter. I go to the school board meeting, I don't even really want to go, okay? Because I had just lost an election, telling the truth. Ran for state city, had just lost the election. School name change come up, you calling me, asking me to come change, help change the name of the school. Well, dog, and I was just on the ballot last month, and if you'd have made me a senator, I'd have been down there with my level, but now you want me to come and fight, right? I show up anyway. 
diligence, consistency even when you don't feel like it, the work that I had already done through the years. So then I go viral again, right? I can't tell you that we are not strategic because we are. But I can never predict how my platform is going to grow because it ain't about having a platform. It's about the work that you do that you get to use the platform to display. And if you ain't got no work, you ain't gonna get no platform. And so for the people who wonder how, I had 8,000 followers two years ago, but nobody said about that. I ran for Congress in 2021 and missed it by 1,500 votes with $500,000 running against people with four million. Didn't spend but $30,000 on TV, $7,000 on radio, put the rest of the money into a ground strategy that shook up the entire state. We went to New Orleans for community, I'm not from, and won 148 precincts out of 300. Now, you might not know uh, politics, but coming from that North Baton Rouge and going into New Orleans with that kind of uh, numbers, somebody told me before we got in the race, I was hitting above my weight. When the election was over, I asked them which one of us was above the out of their weight class. Now, I might not have won the election, but everybody in Louisiana knows we need business. And what we have proven now is there's a white Democrat in the race in Louisiana. You don't know his name, do you? And I ain't going to tell it to you. <laughs> All right? I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you how much money he raised and when he announced. He announced in October of 2021. From October to December, he raised $195,000. I announced January 11th. We have raised over $600,000 since January 11th. There's one candidate that has a chance to win in the state of Louisiana, and he is sitting in Atlanta, Georgia today. And the way that we win that election is building people power from all over this country. The money ain't in Louisiana, okay? So I ain't staying in Louisiana for the first quarter of the year. I'm going to go all over the country to get the resources because I learned a lesson. I can build the best ground game in the world, but if I ain't on TV talking to Grandma, if I ain't in the mailbox, I ain't going to get her. I know how to get Pookie and Ray Ray. Now I need the money to go get grandma and let them know that I'm in it too. 